please join me and give a warm welcome to Marcelo and Chuck. <laughs> All right, thank you for being here. So both of you are new CEOs. You're leading companies that are right at the heart of delivering this next wave of mobility. But I'm not sure if we could find a greater contrast between the two backgrounds of you to two top executives. <laughs> so let's start by focusing on how you found your way to your new jobs. Let's start with you, Marcella. Well, thanks. Uh, so good to be here, Meredith. I was many years sitting over there and listening to many carrier CEO, so it's great to be here. And I must tell you that you look so much better in yellow <laughs> than you did in red, <laughs> right? <laughs> Doesn't she? Uh, hey, that's good already. Look at uh, you. Uh, so, you know, how did I land this job? I mean, so to tell everybody at the audience, any of you can land a job like this. All it takes is a Japanese uh, multi-billionaire successful CEO to actually like to see what you were doing. And he convinced me to buy my company, Brightstar, that most of you know and take on the role of being the CEO of Sprint. And I think Massa's idea was very simple. He says, why don't you grab a 116-year-old corporate America and figure out a way how to make it a different company, make it an entrepreneurial company, and figure out a way how to compete differently. And the only instruction that he's given me, he said, be very aggressive, be very disruptive, change things around, right? If you look at our industry, it's one that Pretty much, networks have been built the same way for the last 10 years with the same OEMs. We all go, used to go to the same tower companies, sold phones the exact same way with subsidies and two-year contracts, and provided the same crappy customer service for the last few years. So he's told me to come in and figure out a way how to do things different. And I'll tell you, it's been such a fun year. We spent the first year cutting AT&T's and Verizon's rate plans or bills in half. That was fun. You know, we've moved on to a... Uh, you know, offering today uh, all the DirecTV customers a choice to not be stuck with AT&T, and they can come to Sprint, so that's been a lot of fun. We've had fun by introducing the first leasing program that when I introduced it a year ago, everybody laughed, and it was great to see Apple copied yesterday, and, uh, and some of our competitors basically copying it. So I think overall, you know, we're happy. We have a lot of good things that we'll talk about. iPhone forever, changing the way Americans buy their mobile phone. So I think overall, you know, it's good. Now going forward, the reason why I'm excited to be here is you can look at a Sprint as a company that's going to partner with traditional and non-traditional companies. And many of you sitting, sitting on the audience know that a Sprint is looking for innovative, disruptive companies to hum, come help us as we transform a Sprint and the future of a Sprint. Terrific. <laughs> No, listen, Chuck, your path is actually different. You've been with Cisco since the 1990s. Yeah. Um, John Chambers served as your company CEO for two decades and then specifically groomed you to succeed him. So what, what approach are you bringing in the first few weeks to your new job? Well, first of all, I want to reiterate what Marcelo said. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, nice to talk to all you guys. And I have to, I have to just say that I thought we worked in a competitive industry, but you guys take it to a new level with all the talking, <laughs> you know. We, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. we, we call out VMware, you know, and it's on the front page of the uh, Wall Street Journal, and you guys just do it every day. So, it's, uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, the, the process that we went through was fascinating, and we are incredibly proud of our culture and the fact that, you know, this, this process for John's replacement went on for three years, and the candidates were actively involved for 10 months. And we still surprised everyone when we announced it, which I think is a great statement. And I would say the reason, uh, or you know, as I think about this and what I talked to our board about through the process, was I have a unique view on what we do really well and frankly, what we don't do really well. And having grown up through the company, I know where those things are. And so I have a, uh, I have a view that we have to take many of the things that have made us great and we have to be very honest about things that have made us great in the past that won't matter going forward, and we have to let those go. And then we have to combine those with you know, some different things as we look out into the future that are going to make us successful. And, and I think that those are the biggest things that I truly understand, and uh, I also am incredibly impatient. And so we are, uh, we're moving with speed. You know, I was announced on May 4th, and, uh, 
and was actually effective only on July 26th. But five weeks after I was announced, I announced our new leadership team. And it was a combination of great Cisco leaders combined with uh, great external leaders, which is an example of what we have to do as we look forward. So we're excited about uh, partnering uh, with, uh, with people in this room and, and really connecting ourselves to the future, which is, which is tremendously exciting. Well, Chuck, as you mentioned, May 4th, you're on day 46. So, um, you know, can you give us a little bit more about your approaches um, to the different challenges that you've had and staffing and setting a different direction, maybe the company's culture to act with greater speed, I think, is one of your uh, priorities? <laughs> yeah, we, we are moving uh, rapidly. And, and the, the announcement of the leadership team five weeks after being announced was not an accident, right? It was a signal that we wanted to send that, we have to move faster. And if you think about what all of us face and you think about what our customers face, is we work, we live in a world that is just unbelievably dynamic. And it's, it's not just the technology transitions, but the geopolitical dynamics that exist around the world, the speed at which economic transitions are occurring, and, and candidly, the randomness with which they're occurring, uh, as opposed to historically where they were very patterned. I think you, you look at the geopolitical, the economic, and then the technology transitions, and frankly, the pressure that our customers are under with the potential disruption that everyone is thinking about, whether they're going to disrupt or they're going to face uh, competitors who are going to come at their business model. So we have to move with greater speed. There is no choice. And what we, uh, we just accomplished in Q4, and it's, it's ironic because people kind of yawn when I say this, but we had a record quarter. And you know, this is the Cisco that supposedly was in our heyday in the 90s. And uh, people say, okay, you had a record quarter. But we, we sold more of our technology in our last quarter than we have in the 30 year history of the company. And, uh, and at the same time, when things are going well, that's a time where you really have to have the courage to look at how you have to change to, uh, to address the future. So uh, we're excited and you're gonna see us move faster and faster. We're excited too. Um, Marcelo, you, we talked a little bit about this last night, but you were building one of the most diverse teams of a Fortune 500. You were from Bolivia. I also count Brazil, Canada, Austria, Australia. You're quadrupling the diversity in Kansas City in the process. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you think about shaping a culture and embracing the pace of change? So every time I try to recruit people from New York and LA to Kansas City, <laughs> I recruited myself from Miami Beach to Kansas City, and it's a great place. <laughs> but it was really, really hard. So I figure if you bring foreigners, you know, they think they're coming to the US, so they come happily. <laughs> they come happily to Kansas City. <laughs> now, kidding aside, I mean, one of the fundamental pillars of our transformation journey is going to make sure that we have the best team. And I think the approach we've taken is we've done global searches. We basically have found the best professionals, regardless whether they live in the US, they're Americans. And I'll tell you, it's fascinating to do some of my staff meetings where it's like United Nations. You have a Japanese, you have Australians, you have Austrians. You have our technology group has have built some of the best networks in the world, in Japan, in Australia, in Brazil. Our CFO has worked in Hong Kong, in Australia. So I think overall, you know, we have a great team of people. And when it comes to our team, it's more than team. I think one of the things that we've done is we've broken the, I call it the, the walls of Sprint, where it was so hard to partner. And what we've done is we've struck some of the most amazing partnerships. I figured that, I don't know if you guys have had a different experience buying a mobile phone at a store, but it's a pretty traumatizing experience. So we've partnered with a company called Carphone Warehouse, which is the world's leading retailer. It's a UK-based company. And what we're changing in retail is amazing. We've partnered with my former company called Brightstar, which was the worldwide leader in buying and selling used phones. And if you look the way every new phone is being sold, there's a trading. So we're definitely using our company. We also partnered with one of the biggest banks in the world in order for us to offer a special credit to the soft prime community. And I'll tell you, from a culture perspective, is Sprint is a company now that embraces partnerships with outside companies. And we are building a culture where employees are encouraged to take risks, which one of, things, one of the biggest learning lessons going from an entrepreneurial company like Brightstar to corporate America is people are rewarded to not take risks. Because if you take risks and you do bad, you get fired. So we're trying to change the culture where actually people come up with new ideas. And most of the things that we do are coming from them. 
Really interesting. So I'm going to just take this one more step, because I think that's what everybody wants. This is what I think everybody wants to know, that the challenges that Sprint faces are, are really they're well known. You inherited a company that's perceived to be on the decline. Um, problems with the network, the overall customer experience. So can you fix the company? And what have you been already doing to do that? So let's be honest. I mean, a lot of people have written off, had written off Sprint. I mean, everybody had fun the other three carriers basically taking customers away from Sprint. So I think that was my first uh, challenge. And I think we surprised a lot of people with the result. We've gone from, if you look at a prior year, we lost 2 million customers. This year, we've added 3.5 million customers, which is by far the highest record growth that Sprint has had in many years. Our stock has gone uh, up and down, but just this month alone, our stock is up 55%. So it's been a good month, so we're happy about that. And when you look at our product, which is our network, our network used to be dead last. Our network is no longer dead last. Our network is now number three. In voice, you know, the last result shows that we've tied AT&T. And as you know, we're already the best network in places like Las Vegas or Denver, Indianapolis, Kansas City. And I think looking ahead, we have a very, very clear plan, a very different plan on how we plan to densify our network. We plan to, to be quite honest, it'll be the largest deployment of sites that have been done in the history of US in the shortest period of time. And uh, you know, I think one of the main parts of fixing a Sprint is you know, we went and we spoke to our customers. And we did thousands of interviews. And we asked people, what is it that you really care when you're going to select a network, when you select a carrier? And people repeat three basic things. We want to make sure you have the right price. We want to make sure you have the right product, which is network. And we want to make sure that you give us a good customer experience. <clears throat> So what are we doing in these areas? One is we become the absolute price leader in the industry. And then people say, but how could, is, is that responsible to be a price leader? Well, being the price leader with the ARPU of the US still makes us one of the highest ARPU companies in the world. So make no mistake, we're very clear that in, in this case, you know, we're going to continue to lead the industry from a pricing perspective. Secondly, from a network perspective, is customers want a great network. And you know, we're in the process of building our network, and I'll talk to you a little more about that. And then thirdly, from a customer experience, we're pretty much redefining the way Americans are going to get a mobile phone. And I'll, t I'll take a second to explain that. I find it absurd, crazy, ridiculous, that people have a two-year contract with their carrier, and Apple launches a new device every year. So every time there's a new launch of a device or there's a Galaxy launch, most people don't have access because they're tied either to a subsidy contract or to what, even though some people call it no contract, they're still signing an ins a financing contract. So we launched something called iPhone Forever, which is very simple. Every time there's a new phone that comes out, you go to Sprint store, you drop off your phone. In less than 10 minutes, you walk out with your new phone. So that way, you're always going to have the latest technology. So those are the sort of things that we're doing to fix Sprint. And I'll tell you, we feel extremely positive that we're going to have one of the biggest transformations and turnarounds in telecom history. I love it. I love it. Um, OK, Chuck, your turn. <laughs> so Cisco is in a different place, but it, it has its own challenges identifying a future path yeah. and new opportunities. So you've talked about how Cisco needs to listen more intently to your customers than ever before. So what is your concern about this, and how are you changing the culture in the company so your people are taking on new challenges? Well, you know, if you look back at our history, what we've, we've gone through several phases. The first was where the, you know, the, the economics and the return for our customer just around connectivity back in the 90s was enough. So we would connect you know, retail branches and consolidate networks and save money. We'd connect people, and they became more productive. And you know, by connecting, you could then drive e-commerce and those sorts of things. Then we moved to convergence, where we really were converging different technologies to IP, and then and providing more value to our customers based on that convergence. And I think both of those are necessary in the future, but they're not sufficient. If you think about the crazy kind of real-time world that we live in that I was describing earlier, this is why our customers now are looking at how do I get to the benefit of the technology faster? That's all they care about, right? Our IT organizations, the IT organizations or the network build, these guys, they want to spend 75 to 80% of their time working on the strategic value of the technology to the organization, not integrating systems together, right? That's just not of value to the company or to the entity anymore. And if you think about our, our history, we built this company based on 15 billion connections to date, 15 billion. And by 2020, they're going to be 50 billion. 
In the next decade, there'll be 500 billion. So I've told our teams that, A, I think the next decade for us can be greater than the past, simply because of all of this connectivity. And if you think about what our, our customers are going to do, you've got from 2014 to 2019, you see three time, a triple uh, bandwidth increase on the overall IP traffic, 10 times the increase in mobile IP traffic, and in 2019, 40% of that I mobile IP traffic is going to be machine to machine. And it's going to be massively distributed. And so we're going to go from connectivity and convergence being enough to now you, we have to provide the insights that help our customers make different decisions based on these new connections. So as we begin to connect mining operations or we begin to connect you know, automobiles that have been discussed here, you know, these things provide data and insights that allow customers to make different decisions at a different pace. And so my feedback to our team has been, number one, the pace of change is greater than anything we've ever seen, period. And uh, we, just we were talking backstage about just all the things that have happened in this space over the last two or three weeks. I mean, it's just moving so rapidly that it's more important than ever to listen to our customers, even if they're telling us something that we may not want to hear, right? May not be comfortable, and that's actually when we have to listen more intently. And we've also built our company and our history in catching market transitions and actually accelerating those and to our favor, and I told our teams, we actually have to embrace market transitions sometimes when they might not even feel so comfortable. So those are the messages that I've been sending, and I think that as you look at this massively distributed infrastructure that's going to be built out, the network is going to be a key enabler of releasing those insights, and the network's going to be a key enabler of actually driving security, which is the number one priority that everyone has as we do this. Sure. Um, well, Cisco, we've all been talking about Apple. That's kind of the buzz. C Cisco is also working closely with Apple. So tell us about your new partnership with Apple and what you expect it to do for your business. Well, so we had, we had 20,000 of my closest friends here last week. Uh, <laughs> we had our annual sales meeting, and we literally bring 20,000 people together from around the world. Where he did Rapper's Delight, which he might do with you all if you're really nice. <laughs> I know. She was saying, you were very buttoned up. And I said, well, if you'd have seen me last week, you wouldn't believe that. <laughs> Uh, but um, I didn't say it that way. <laughs> well, you didn't, but you implied it. Uh, <laughs> so I was trying to give her some data points to prove that I'm not boring. Uh, but um, anyway, the, uh, the team came together, and we announced on Monday a partnership with Apple, which really brings the power of our innovation, the power of Apple's innovation, and we think that we can together drive new innovation for our customer. So uh, one of the key things we're doing out of that relationship is that we are going to give the customers the ability to prioritize key enterprise applications that are, that are running on iOS, running on these devices. Uh, you know, as, uh, as Tim Cook said last week, you, know, you, you have, you have a, a very mission-critical productivity application running while your colleague is looking at a YouTube video, and you want to be able to prioritize that and make sure those applications work effectively. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do, which is, uh, which is really interesting, is we're going to uh, take the, uh, the iPhone and we're going to, we're the number one enterprise voice player in the world, so we have these unified communications and these IP voice systems that have sort of an over overarching collaboration architecture with video and contact center and everything brought together. And we're actually going to take the iPhone and make it an integrated device within that architecture inside an enterprise. So if you walk in your office today, you know, we, we joked last week that you'll take your iPhone because that's where your, your, your contacts are. You'll look up a number and then you'll dial it on your phone on your desk. Anybody ever done that? <laughs> and so we're going to integrate these things completely so that uh, the, the iPhone is actually a client on a Cisco unified communications infrastructure. That's the second thing. And the third is we're going to take all of their devices and tie tremendously uh, tight integration between our enterprise video platforms and their video capabilities. So, it's a, it's a tremendous relationship. They have a great interest of getting into the enterprise. Uh, you know, Tim believes it's so important. You said you talked to Tim mm -hmm. yesterday, and he continued to espouse the value of this partnership. And uh, Tim actually flew here to be on stage for 20 minutes last week with, uh, with our 20,000 folks, which shows how important the relationship is to him. And then he had his top sales leaders who sat in the front row on uh, Thursday as we closed the event. So we're really excited about it. We, and we're excited about what we can do for our customers. We think we can bring some unique capabilities between the two companies. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Marcel, I'm going to go back at it. Ready? 
Um, yeah. you, again, here we go. <laughs> Everybody wants to know. Um, so you have made some really bold statements about Sprint becoming the number one or number two uh, in the country in the next few years. Sprint has been promising these kinds of improvements for a long time, but has yet to deliver. Um, how will you succeed this time? So uh, we don't say next few years. I mean, we've been very clear. We expect to build the number one network or number two network in every major market in the next 24 months. That's my job. And I've learned that, as you say, you know, in the real estate business, everybody says location, location, location. In this business, it's network, network, network. But people forget to build a great network. As you heard from uh, Chairman Wheeler yesterday, you need a spectrum. And there's one thing that nobody can dispute is we have more spectrum than any other carrier in the planet. Right, so we have a lot of a lot of good spectrum, and you know, in for the last two years, it's been about setting the right foundation. When you look at where our network is today, our network is by far the most improved network, and that's one that we're going to continue to build upon. Upon upon it. Let's talk about what is it that what is it that we're going to do. When we look at what's happening in the world, data usage, as you heard, and I'm not going to repeat the same quotes of of so much data, but it's pretty much best way to look at it, it's basically exploding. And data consumption will double this year, and double next year, and double next year, and the numbers are huge. And if you try to use some of the networks in the US in some cities, you're going to see that there is already congestion. So there is already spectrum crunch. And that's an area where we're going to build a network with the most amount of capacity. Now, what did we learn yesterday? When you look at the Apple's announcement, to me, one of the most important parts that a lot of people don't talk about it is now, when you take video, you're going to be taking 4K videos. Well, that sounds awesome for a consumer, but for a carrier, that means the level of, cap the level of data movement, data traffic that we're going to have by having millions and millions of people suddenly taking out videos, 4K videos, or if you look at the new pictures that you're able to take with the new iPhone, which is our, those live pictures, meaning it's like a short video clip, so pictures are no longer static. So as you start sharing that and you start sharing the video, Basically, you need a network that has the capacity to be able to provide that. So what are we doing? First thing we're doing is we're going to leverage our spectrum. We're the carrier with the most spectrum in the world. We have over 200 megahertz of spectrum. And when you combine that and you put, develop a new architecture, and our new architecture is based upon adding thousands of microsites and tens of thousands of small cells all over the US, utilizing a different type of backhaul, which traditionally has been what has slowed down the buildings of the network, and you add carrier aggregation, which is something that we did. And so also something that a lot of people don't talk about it, the new iPhone has two carrier aggregation, which means the speeds of to all Sprint customers on this new iPhone are going to double or triple as soon as they get their hands on. So we look at how we're going to build that network. And when you add also that our main shareholder, SoftBank, has built one of the most advanced networks in the world, you put all this together, and we feel very confident in our plan. Now, it's not just talking. So the first place that we actually deployed our network architecture to the way we wanted to deploy was Denver. And for those of you who saw the results of Denver, they were published yesterday by Root Metrics, and Sprint became the fastest network with smoke past Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, and we tied for having the best network with Verizon. So what I can tell you is that you can expect to see what happens in Denver to happen market after market in the US in the next two years. So we feel extremely confident that we have found a way, leveraging new technologies, leveraging new companies, to basically build an amazing network. And that's what my job is going to be in the next two years. OK, I believe. Let's go. <laughs> Better believe. Um, and, and Chuck, um, we all, especially at CTI, we look to Cisco all the time on where the demand and the consumption are going. Um, what's your perspective on densification, mobile demand, yeah. and how do we cope with the data explosion? I guess, how can Cisco help solve this? Well, I think everybody, Marcelo just talked about it. The, 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 the traffic is just exploding, right? We can throw, we can throw lots of numbers out. We, we, we do analysis of this. Uh, every year, and we think it's going to be a combination. When you think about 50 billion going to 500 billion devices, you have to have different uh, capabilities of how you connect these devices, and then and then again, release the value of them to both our consumer, your consumer customers, as well as the enterprise customers. So we've got you know a couple of two and a half million small cells out there. We got 40 million 
uh, enterprise uh, and uh, service provider wireless devices that are out there, and we think a combination bringing together licensed and unlicensed spectrum inside the enterprise is an area where we can help to, to unleash some of this new connectivity in addition to some of the self-optimizing network capabilities we have. So our view is that we want to enable any connectivity anywhere in the world that our customers need to enable in order to allow their customers to take advantage of what's going on in the marketplace, and that's what we're going to do. So, Well, guys, I really appreciate your coming here. I'm really pulling for both of you, and it's just been a real privilege and treat to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.